Okay, so let's uh, start with the things that we discussed last time. So last time in this lecture, we basically discussed some ideas on top, in terms of like how we can basically reconstruct all these really things from the multi-view images. Uh, so there is basically all the idea, which is called the structure from multi-motion, uh, which is kind of like really big kind of the sort of literature in terms of like doing some 3D reconstruction from the multi-view images. And basically what we discussed last time is that uh, if we have some, not the single view, but the multi-view images, uh, this is kind of the problem in terms of that we don't need to use a kind of the prediction power of the neural net. Uh, we can directly actually, you know, estimate the 3D structure from the given the multi-view images. Uh, so here the whole the idea is basically how we can basically do this kind of the 3D construction from the multi-view images. And we found actually this is kind of the huge kind of the framework that in, uh, includes lots of kind of the components there. Uh, so the basic idea uh, in the framework was that basically we are finding some kind of the pixel wise correspondences uh, from the multi -view images. And based on that, we are finding the relative the camera pose information across the, the images. And then once we have the, the camera information for each of the images, then now we can shoot the a ray for each of the pixel and see the intersection of the rays uh, coming from the all the corresponding the points. Uh, then that gives us basically the information about the 3D the points. And then we are running the bundle the adjustment, which is basically jointly optimizing uh, both the camera poses and also the 3D positions. Uh, so this is kind of the, the basic idea in terms of like making some building blocks of the structure from motion the pipeline. And what we discussed last time is basically some more the details in terms of like how we can uh, basically estimate uh, the relative the camera pose from the, the, the pixel wise the correspondence information. Well, so for that, we basically discussed some kind of this, uh, the basic idea for the camera model as well. Uh, so typically the camera model. So this is kind of the, the simplest the camera model, the Pino camera model, uh, which is not involving any kind of the nonlinear factor. So everything is basically in, uh, represented as a matrix. Uh, so the camera model is basically represented as kind of the three by four D matrix, uh, which is basically decomposed into the intrinsic parameters and the extrinsic parameters. So extrinsic parameters are basically rotation and the translation in the three D space, and the intrinsic parameter is basically about the projection from the three D to the two D. Uh, so through the, uh, the camera the matrix, we could basically map a point uh, in the 3D space with world coordinates into the point in the 2D plane uh, on, on the basically image. So that was the basic idea. And also we represented uh, all the 2D coordinates as the homogeneous coordinates in a way that we are having the uh, three dimensional vectors. But you know, however, we basically multiply any the scalar the number, the vector becomes the same. So that was the idea for the homogeneous coordinates, uh, also mapping the 2D points into the 3D uh, the vector. And then we also discussed some the basic the terms in the epipolar the geometry. So given this kind of the setup that we are having a uh, one point, the 2D point, or it's kind of a pixel in the one plane, uh, if we have some kind of the, uh, this kind of ray in the 3D space, then this projection of this ray into the uh, plane of the other view uh, is called the epipolar line. So we are having this kind of the epipolar line, uh, which is basically the line that contains the corresponding point x prime as well, right? So this is also the case that we are representing each of the line as kind of a line equation. x plus b y plus c w equals zero. So which means that when the, when we represent the line as kind of these three numbers of so the line equation. Uh, basically mapping each of the line into the A vector in this three-dimensional space, then we could see that uh, basically the dot product of this, the line parameters uh, with, with the homogeneous the coordinates of uh, the corresponding the pixel uh, should be basically zero uh, because the point is on the line, right? So that was basically the case that we are defining the epipolar line. Uh, and we also could define the epipole, uh, which is a projection of the uh, image center uh, to the, the image plane, uh, to the other image plane. So we are having the two epipoles here. And then uh, based on the, uh, the, the relationship between the point and the line, um, we also could basically uh, consider the point line the duality, uh, which was the case that you know, uh, the line, uh, which is basically joining the two points, uh, can be calculated as the cross product like this. And also the intersection point of the two lines could be also represented as kind of cross product like this, uh, because what we can see is that 
uh, basically we are finding a line uh, which becomes the, the orthogonal uh, in the 3D space with the both of the point X and the X prime. So this is this is basically the case that we are basically mapping all the 2D the, the points as the three-dimensional the, the vector in the three-dimensional space and also mapping the line, the 2D line as kind of the vector in the three-dimensional space as well. Uh, so this will be the case that we are finding a vector which becomes the orthogonal uh, to the all the two uh, three-dimensional D vectors, uh, which will be the case that we are finding the cross product of these two. Make sense? And also the other way around is the same. So if we also uh, have the two lines and finding a point which is also uh, in, on the both of the lines, uh, that will be the case that we are also finding a three-dimensional D vector uh, which, which becomes the orthogonal to the two vectors. So there will be also the another case that we are finding the cross product of these two. So we could basically represent this kind of the point and the rhyme relationship like this. And also the cross product actually can be represented as the matrix multiplication uh, by basically making this kind of this Q-symmetric D matrix. So we can rewrite the same the cross product here uh, like this. So as you can see, basically, if we have this kind of this Q-symmetric D matrix, uh, basically changing the sign right here uh, in the opposite the, the elements, uh, basically making by making this Q-symmetric matrix like this, then we can basically represent uh, the same the cross product as the matrix multiplication like this. So this was kind of the basic thing that we discussed last time. And then we discussed the fundamental D matrix. So which was basically the matrix that includes the uh, the pixel wise the correspondence. So when you have the uh, the the corresponding the point the pairs at the x and the x prime in one image to the other, uh, then we could basically define a three by three matrix like this uh, that satisfies this kind of relationship with the, all the pairs of the corresponding the points the two D points. And what we could see last time was that basically this matrix. Is basically uh, mapping the each of the point into their basically epipolar line. So what we could see is that basically uh, since the you know this is zero, so this x you know x l prime is the epipolar line of the x, and x prime is the corresponding point of the x, right? Which means that obviously this epipolar line should pass uh, through the corresponding point the x prime. So the dot product of these two should be zero, right? So from this, what we can see is that uh, f times the x is becomes basically the you know uh, the epipolar line of the x because we know that uh, this is zero right? by definition, right? Uh, so the meaning of the the fundamental D matrix is basically mapping each of the point in one view uh, to the epipolar line in the other view. So that is basically meaning of the the fundamental D matrix, right? Uh, actually, we could consider the same thing for the uh, the normalized coordinates. So what we are seeing so far was basically the case of like taking two D points, which becomes like uh, mapping the world coordinates with the you know extrinsic D parameters and the projecting that into the two D plane, uh, which results in basically the two D uh, the points, right? So let's think about that. We are basically making the uh, this intrinsic D matrix as kind of the identity. Uh, so we are not having here this, so just having this. Uh, so basically taking uh, this kind of the uh, the coordinates with some kind of the identity, the intrinsic D matrix uh, is called the normalized two D coordinates. Uh, so which is basically taking the two D coordinates uh, in the the camera D coordinates, right? Uh, basically making the intrinsic matrix to be identity. So this is nothing but basically we are mapping the all the 2D points uh, into the, the camera coordinates by taking the inverse of the intrinsic D matrix. So for those kind of the normalized 2D coordinates, uh, we can define the same type of D matrix, basically defining the matrix like this. So in this case, this matrix is called the essential D matrix, not the fundamental D matrix. Uh, so essential matrix is kind of the same type of the matrix with the fundamental D matrix, uh, but only for the normalized the 2D coordinates before we multiply the intrinsic uh, the, the matrix uh, from the mapping from the 3D to the 2D. Is this clear? So is everything is basically the same. Uh, in the normalized the 2D coordinates, what you can see is that 
basically e times the x hat is basically mapping uh to the you know l one hat uh to the epipolar line in the normalized coordinates. So this is also the matrix mapping a point uh to the epipolar line in the normalized coordinates. The same thing. And uh, the relationship between the essential D matrix and the fundamental D matrix can be written like this. Uh, so basically what you can see is that this is the X prime and this is the X prime transpose. Uh, and from this, you know, what you can see is that uh, basically this multiplication becomes the same uh, with the fundamental D matrix, right? Which means that if we know the intrinsic the parameters of the camera, then we can basically convert the fundamental matrix into the essential matrix and also the other way around as well. Is this clear? So basically here also I assuming that all the images share the same intrinsic D matrix here, uh, but it doesn't need to be the case that we are having the same the shared the intrinsic D matrix. Uh, it's, it's okay that each of the image has some different intrinsic D, D parameters. Clear? So from this, actually, what we have seen last time is that what we could see is that, so this is basically the setup that we are basically setting uh, the camera coordinates of the first camera as the world coordinates. So it's matter of like, you know, what we choose as the world coordinates, right? So we can choose any kind of the coordinates as the world coordinates. Uh, so let's simplify all the things in a way that we are just picking the, uh, the camera coordinates of the first camera as the world coordinates. So which means that we set the identity matrix for the uh, camera matrix for the first camera. And uh, we're gonna have the camera matrix for the second view. And then we're gonna have the epipoles of each of the images uh, in the normalized coordinates. And here basically, yeah, what we can see is that the normalized coordinates in the first camera is the same with the world coordinates, right? Because that's what we set. Uh, so we set the, uh, the camera coordinates uh, of the first camera as the world coordinates. So this will be the case that we set like this. So from this, uh, what we briefly discussed last time is that, so what you can see about the epipole uh, in the second view is that uh, epipole is basically the case of like, just we are drawing some kind of a line uh, connecting the two, uh, the camera centers. So this can be considered as kind of like we are projecting the camera center of the first view uh, to the plane, image plane of the second view. In the, so we, we see everything in the normalized coordinates. So what we can see is that the camera center here, uh, the, the first view is basically the origin uh, because we set the, uh, the, the first camera coordinates as kind of the, the world coordinates. And then we are mapping this to the second view. So we're gonna multiply the extrinsic D matrix and since everything is like the, now the normalized coordinates, uh, the camera intrinsic D matrix is just the identity, right? So what we can see is that the epipole uh, in the second view can be computed as basically the multiplication, uh, basically transforming the origin of the first view uh, with the extrinsic D parameters of the second view. So what we can see is that basically the epipole of the second view become the same uh, with the translation, right? Uh, it's very obvious. Uh, and then from this, what we can see is that basically we know that uh, this essential D matrix is mapping the you know, normalized coordinates of the X here uh, into the you know, epipolar line in the normalized coordinates. The essential matrix is mapping a point into the epipolar line and we know that this epipolar line is a line that is basically you know, joining two points. Uh, one is the corresponding D point of the X and the other one is basically epipole, right? So yeah, by definition, uh, so essential matrix was basically the matrix that maps the, each of the point to the epipolar line. Uh, and this is basically the line which is connecting the corresponding point of this point and the epipole are uh, the same, the image plane. So this, right? So this is basically L hat plane. Uh, from the previous slide, well, basically what we can see is that this epipole is the same with the T plane here. And then we can find the corresponding point of the X hat uh, by applying the, uh, the camera D matrix, the second view. 
So no intrinsic D matrix because you know this is the case that we are handling the normalized coordinates, right? So from this, what you can see is that we can just like calculate this. Then we're gonna see this, and obviously the cross product, the same vector become the zero. Then we're gonna basically have this. So this is basically nothing but basically changing the cross product form into the matrix form. So from this, um, basically this will be true for the, any kind of the arbitrary the point at the x set. And from this, what you can see is that actually the essential the matrix of these kind of two uh, the, the, the camera actually can be calculated like this. Uh, you know, making some kind of skew symmetric the matrix from the translation the factor uh, multiplied by the rotation the matrix. Uh, so basically in this way, we can see the relationship uh, between the essential the matrix and the, the camera matrix of the second view. In the case that when you set the camera coordinates of the first camera as the world coordinates. This clear? Any question on this? Is everything okay? So this is basically what we discussed last time. So, and then if we briefly see something that we missed in the previous slide is that actually I said that the fundamental the matrix, matrix is the rank two matrix, uh, which means that it's not that, uh, it's not a invertible the matrix. And the reason why the fundamental the matrix is the rank two matrix is that basically uh, we are having this essential the matrix, right? The thing is that this Q symmetric D matrix is the a rank two matrix by the definition of this Q symmetric D matrix and multiplying the other D matrix also results in another D rank two matrix, which means that the essential matrix is the a rank two matrix. And as you can see also the fundamental D matrix is can be uh, represented as the matrix, matrix multiplication uh, of something else with the essential D matrix uh, which means that the fundamental the matrix is also uh, another the rank two matrix. Uh, so that's basically a thing. So from the fact that you know E can be represented as the T uh, schismatic matrix times the R prime, uh, we can see that the essential matrix is a, is a rank two matrix. And also the fundamental D matrix is another rank two, two matrix, which means that both of them are basically non invertible D matrix. Uh, which also basically make this kind of condition. The determinant of those these matrices should be zero. Uh, clear? And also one more thing is that uh, both of the essential and the fundamental D matrices, uh, those are basically homogeneous the quantities, which means that whatever the number we, the, the scalar number, we multiply uh, to this kind of D matrix, that does not basically change the meaning of this matrix. Because if we see the definition of those matrices, x prime transpose x was zero, right? So basically, we are finding any kind of the matrix that basically satisfies this kind of condition for all the pairs of the corresponding the 2D points, right? Which means that whatever the number we multiply uh, by the, to this kind of the, the matrix, uh, this does not change the meaning of this matrix, right? So this means that there are some kind of the scale ambiguity. Whatever number uh, we multiply this matrix is okay. Uh, having the same the fundamental the matrix. Uh, so it's basically having another kind of the ambiguity uh, in terms of that we cannot specify like one unique matrix uh, for the pairs of the 2D points, uh, but we can basically you know, specify the one matrix uh, up to the ambiguity in the scale. Uh, you can basically multiply any number, the scalar number to the matrix. Uh, uh, it's clear. So from this, what we can see is that actually we are finding a three by three matrix, but basically we are, uh, which means sounds like we are having the nine the, the, the elements, nine degree of the freedom, uh, but we are losing one degree of the freedom because it is the homogeneous the quantity. So we can multiply any D number to the matrix. And also we are losing one degree of the freedom as well because the determinant of the, the matrix is also zero. So we, the degree of the freedom of the matrix F is actually seven, uh, which means that uh, we can basically uh, you know, find this matrix uh, with the basically seven D equations. So that's basically what we are going to see. So technically it's possible to basically define a, this you know, F D 
the matrix with the seven equations, uh, but some, some numerical issues, we're going to actually use some kind of the eight equations uh, to find this fundamental the matrix. So basically, you know, the reason why we discuss all the thing is that we are, what we are going to do is that from the two images, and also there are the pixel-wise correspondences, basically what we want to do is that when we set the camera the matrix of the first view as kind of the identity the matrix, we're gonna basically find the camera matrix of the second view. That's our the final goal, right? Given the pixel-wise correspondence of the two images, uh, when you set the camera coordinates of the first view as the, the identity the kind of the matrix, uh, we're gonna find the camera the matrix of the second view. So that's what we are going to do. And the reason why we basically discuss all the things is that we are going to find this camera D matrix by first calculating the fundamental D matrix and then calculating the essential D matrix and then by basically calculating the, you know, the camera D matrix. So that's what we are going to do. Okay. See, we have seen the relationship between the fundamental matrix and the essential D matrix, right? Uh, so in the previous one. Yeah, we have seen this relationship. Sorry. Uh, you know, uh, from the F, we can calculate uh, the E like this. So once we have the F, then from this F, we can calculate the essential D matrix, right? And if we have the essential D matrix, then, sorry, there's a... From this, we can see that the essential matrix has some kind of the relationship with the camera matrix like this. Make sense? So by utilizing all this kind of the relationship, what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to first calculate the fundamental D matrix and then essential D matrix and then the camera D matrix. This is the very typical the, the pipeline of like calculating the, uh, the camera, the, the pose of the two images. Uh, it is clear. Any questions so far? So, do you have any ideas in terms like given any some like lots of the pairs of the two D points and X and the X prime? So, let's say we are having lots of such kind of pairs. Given this kind of the pairs of the you no know, uh two D D points, how can you calculate the fundamental D matrix? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, first question. Yeah, so basically the idea is like somehow making this problem is kind of the a sort of the least security problem. Uh, so basically what we can do is that uh, we know uh, by definition that you know x prime transpose x i this is zero, right? Which means that we can rewrite all the things in a way that we are having like x i prime y i prime one times so you know, f11 f12 f13 da 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 and x y one this should be zero right then actually we can rewrite uh this kind of all the equation uh into some kind of the vectorized form of the, the fundamental the matrix f like this so we can see that you no know, uh, when you have this kind of like one single the multiplication, this becomes the same as basically calculating this you know x prime transpose uh, multiplied by the f times the x uh, as the zero, right? So these two are basically the same equation. So with, when you have this, uh, you know when you have this matrix form, this is the same with uh, the form of like this calculation. 
So basically, when we vectorize uh, the fundamental matrix, basically rearranging all the elements in the fundamental matrix into the, this kind of like one, you know, very thin the, the vector like this, uh, we can see that like one pair of the you know corresponding the points, the two D points gives us gives us basically like one equation like this. Make sense. Uh, so what we can see is that uh, we can basically uh, you know stack all these kind of the rules into make some kind of the big least security problem. So let's say uh, like this is kind of like one rule for the one pair. Uh, if we have another the pair, then we can stack one more rule, right? And if we have another the pair, then we can also stack one more the rule. So in this way, we can actually make some kind of the giant matrix with the A times the F. Let's say this is the F. Uh, so, and then we basically are finding a solution of this, right? So this A will be basically K times the eight, uh, no, one, two, three, nine, D matrix, and K is the number of the pairs. Make sense? And we are basically finding the solution of this. So how can you find the solution of this? Uh, so basically, if the rank of this matrix is less than nine, uh, basically if the rank of this matrix is the eight, uh, there will be only one solution of this neural vector. So we can basically, uh, not only one vector, but up to the, uh, the scale of the ambiguity. Uh, still we can basically multiply any number to this, the, the F vector. Uh, but you know, so we can just pick any vector that basically satisfies this, right? So basically this means that if the rank of the A is basically less than the nine, uh, then we can basically find any of the null vector of this matrix. So that will be the solution. But uh, if we have more than the eight, uh, the pairs of the points, uh, then the rank of the A can be greater than eight. And actually, what would the case that the rank of the A matrix, uh, the the k times the nine, the 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 side of the, the side of the matrix has the the rank which is greater than the eight? Do you have any thoughts on that? So technically, if we have some the perfect uh the correspondence of the the points, without any noise, then whatever the number of the the pairs that we have the rank of this matrix should not exceed the eight. In a way that we can find the solution of basically a uh, this equation. There should be always basically a solution for this if we have the perfect the correspondence of the pixels. But we are basically finding the correspondence of the pixels and there can be some of the noise there, uh, which means that there may not be the solution of this. Then we are basically finding the solution in a way to basically solve the least curiosity problem in a way that basically, uh, even in the case that when there is no solution for this, uh, we are actually finding a solution that basically uh, minimize this. Minimizing the norm of this the matrix multiplication. Uh, Makes sense. So in such kind of the cases, how we can find the solution minimizing this? Uh, so this is basically the problem that we can solve using the SVD. So we are not going to get into the older details, uh, but if you took the linear algebra course, you might uh, get some kind of idea how we can get this. Uh, so basically when you decompose the A into the like this, then we can see that the last vector would be V of this matrix, uh, basically the vector which is corresponding to the smallest, uh, the singular value uh, of the sigma here uh, becomes the solution of minimizing this. So in this way, basically, we can uh, even when you have some kind of the noise in the correspondence of the, the pixels, uh, we can find the solution uh, of basically minimizing the a times the f uh, uh, using the SVD. So that's the basic idea. And this is not sufficient because what we know is that uh, we know that this the f matrix should be singular matrix, uh, which rank should be two. Uh, not the full length the matrix. Uh, so next step is that given any kind of the matrix that we found in the previous the uh, the you know the method, uh, we are finding uh, another the matrix uh, which also satisfies the the difference uh, with the given the matrix 
while basically satisfying the this condition where the determinants of the, the matrix become zero. So we are first finding uh, the matrix the f prime uh, by basically by solving the problem of like minimizing this. So this can be solved uh, using the SVD. And then, but the, the solution of this may not satisfy this condition uh, that the, the matrix should not be a full length D matrix. So that, so we are finding another D matrix, which is closest matrix to this one uh, while satisfying the singular matrix D condition. And this is another D problem that we can solve using the SVD again. So everything can be solved using the SVD. So now what we can do is that we can first decompose, uh, sorry, the, I think I see, yeah. Uh, we can basically uh, decompose the given D matrix using the SVD. And we can make the smallest, the singular value to be zero. Uh, then this become the solution of this problem. Finding the closest matrix where the, the, the alpha matrix becomes a singular D matrix. Any question? So this is basically the way that we can find the given the uh, the pixel while the correspondence, uh, yeah, or uh, the this set, uh, we can basically find the fundamental the matrix uh, satisfies the uh, the non-full length the condition. Then once we have the fundamental the matrix, what we can do is that we can now calculate the essential the matrix. Obviously, this is a case that when the intrinsic parameters of the cameras are basically given. Uh, so if we know the intrinsic the matrix of the camera is basically the given, the, by calculating uh, this matrix uh, multiplication, now we can compute the essential the matrix. Obviously, the question might be is the how we can get the intrinsic the parameters. Uh, there are lots of the, the cases, especially these days, that even the, the digital the photos are basically including the information uh, of these intrinsic parameters. Uh, or if we do not have any kind of information for the intrinsic the parameters, uh, we can utilize some technique of the camera the cal calibration. Uh, the camera calibration is basically also a set of the techniques that we can estimate uh, the camera the intrinsic the parameters using some kind of the specific the patterns of the images. Uh, so we are also not going to get into all the details there. So when assuming that we know the intrinsic the matrix, we can let's say calculate the essential matrix from the, uh, the fundamental the matrix. And then now what we are going to do is that basically given this relationship, we also need to decompose the essential matrix into the rotation matrix and the translation. So the next question is that also how we are going to do this, right? But before we basically decompose the essential matrix into the rotation and the translation, uh, there are also some kind of the conditions uh, for the essential D matrix. So basically the, the thing is that, uh, before discussing those things, uh, what do we also kind of the degree of the freedom of the essential D matrix? Any guess for the degree of the freedom of the essential D matrix? So actually, it looks like like seven because the degree of freedom of the fundamental D matrix was seven, and it's just like the matrix multiplication of the fundamental D matrix with the camera intrinsic the parameters. But the, actually, the thing is that uh, this the intrinsic parameters also have some kind of specific structure. So actually, the rank this the degree of freedom of the essential D matrix is five. Uh, because also the other way we can see this is that. Uh, the degree of the freedom of the translation is three, right? And what's the degree of the freedom of the rotation D matrix? Is also three, right? If you took the compact graphics or the compact vision the courses, uh, you will see that actually the uh, degree of the freedom of the rotation uh, is three. Basically, with the Euler angles, we can basically represent all the three D rotation with the three numbers, right? Uh, so degree of the freedom is the rotation is three. So it looks like you know, three plus three, six. Six sounds like the uh, the you know degree of the freedom of the essential D matrix. 
uh, but we are also losing one degree of the freedom uh, because of the skill, the ambiguity. So that's basically why we are getting the uh, degree of the freedom of the five uh, for the essential thematics. Uh, which means that you no, know, actually the essential thematics also has some kind of the loss of the constraints uh, that basically uh, is making the matrix to lose some of the, the degree of the freedom. And uh, actually, what we can quickly see is that if we see uh, you know, the SVD decomposition of this Q symmetric D matrix, this Q symmetric D, the SVD decomposition of this Q symmetric D matrix has the form like uh, this. So this is basically the output of the SVD for this Q symmetric D matrix. Having the two equal the singular D values and one zero singular value here. And also, even when you multiply a rotation matrix, this Q symmetric D matrix, uh, the SVD decomposition should be the same. So we also need to have a essential matrix that basically has this form. Basically, when you decompose the essential D matrix like this, uh, we also should have this kind of the uh, decomposition, the opposite. So which means that we are also need we also need to find some kind of the another D matrix from the given the D matrix, which is coming from the fundamental D matrix, uh, which minimizing the difference while also satisfying the condition that the SVD decomposition of this should be basically has this form. Make sense? So we can also find this kind of the form basically by you no know, uh, you know, decomposing the given D matrix and making the last the singular value to be zero, uh, and then basically making the uh, the two singular values to be the same by finding some kind of the uh, some uh, the value which is making some minimal di distance uh, with the given the singular the values. So basically, this is kind of the case that we're having the two projection step. Uh, we are first finding the from the pixel the pairs, we are finding the fundamental D matrix. And then we are basically projecting this to the matrix, which has the seven degree of the freedom. And then from this, we are also computing the essential D matrix. And then we are also doing some kind of the projection step uh, in a way that we are making some kind of the uh, a matrix, which has the five degree of the freedom. And once we have basically this kind of the essential D matrix, uh, e, uh, which has the five degree of the freedom, then now we can consider basically decomposing this uh, into the translation and the rotation. So what we could see is that essential D matrix is the matrix multiplication of the a symmetric D matrix and a rotation D matrix, right? So given the essential D matrix, now it's the matter of like how we decompose this matrix. It's a mul the multiplication of the a, the symmetric D matrix and a rotation D matrix. And the interesting the fact is that there are only four possible such kind of cases. So using SVD again, so everything sounds like the SVD, right? Uh, using the SVD again, uh, now we can find the four such kind of the possible the cases or like representing the given D matrix as kind of the matrix multiplication of the skew symmetric D matrix and the rotation D matrix, uh, which will be those kind of the four cases. Then which one should we pick? Uh, the thing is that so it sounds like there are four possible D cases of the, the camera D matrix from the given the point D correspondences. Uh, but also what we can see if we visualize everything uh, into the two D in the three D the plane, uh, this space is that we can see that like the one is the case that all the three D point is basically in front of the both of the camera. And one is basically the case that the, the 3D point is behind the camera for both of the cases. Like the one is basically the case that the, the 3D point is basically in front of the one camera and the behind of the other camera. And also this is the other way around. Basically the point is basically in front of the other camera and behind of the other camera. So which means that we just need to pick this case, which is the case that the 3D point is basically in front of the both of the cameras. So there is only one single case that uh, the 3D point becomes the in front of the both of the cameras. Make sense? So it turns out that there is only one case that we can find such kind of the camera matrix 
uh, which makes all the 3D points uh, becomes in front of the each of the both of the cameras. So in summary, uh, what we can do in the structure flow motion, the pipeline, uh, pipeline is that uh, we can first basically find corresponding the points uh, of the, the 2D key points. And then uh, given the, the set of the 2D the correspondences, we can use the rank set, the idea in terms of basically find the inlier set of the key points, right? And based on that, we can use the fundamental, the, uh, we can calculate the fundamental D matrix uh, by just making the you know, giant AF uh, times equal the, this equation. By solving this equation, we can basically find the, uh, the fundamental D matrix. And we also need to project the output D matrix to the closest uh, the, you know, you know, uh, D matrix, which becomes the, uh, has the eighth degree of the freedom uh, using the SVD again. And then we can convert this fundamental D matrix into the intrinsic D matrix. Oh, sorry, the, into the essential D matrix here. Uh, given the information of the intrinsic D matrix, uh, we also need to project this into the uh, A matrix, the closest matrix, which has the five degree of the freedom. And then we can decompose the given the essential D matrix with the into the rotation and the translation. And you're gonna have the five of uh, sorry four uh, such kind of the possibility decompositions. Uh, then we can just pick one of one of them, uh, which has some all these three D points in front of the camera. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the full pipeline. This sounds a little bit like the complicated, uh, but if you actually start to implement all the thing, uh, you will see that uh, especially these three, four, five, those kind of things are just like one line of the code. Uh, using the NumPy or the PyTorch. So actually the implementation would be quite straightforward. Uh, there are lots of the details in terms of like how we basically achieve some kind of the numerical stability. Uh, so if you are interested in some more the details, I also recommend you to check out the textbook called the Multi-View Geometry. Uh, this textbook basically uh, describes all the details about the uh, the multi view the, the epipolar geometry kind of things, uh, and those are really topics that we can actually discuss over the entire this semester. Any questions on this? Any questions? No question. I guess like one quick question that we can ask might be is that why do we need to first compute the fundamental the matrix and then compute the essential matrix based on that? If we take like all the normalized the coordinates, then we can consider directly compute the essential the matrix, right? And even the degree of the freedom uh, of the essential D matrix is much smaller into the five uh, degree of the freedom. So even without the like having the eight pairs of the points, using just only the five pairs of the points, we can actually directly compute the essential D matrix. Would it be doable? Yeah, actually, it's also doable. So that's why there is also the vessel which is called the uh, five point algorithm as well. Uh, so. Five point algorithm. Yeah, five point algorithm is basically the case that we are taking the normalized two D coordinates and directly computing the essential D matrix. Uh, similarly, we the fundamental D matrix basically we skip the process of like computing the fundamental D matrix. So it's it's actually doable. Uh, but there are actually some more numerical issues in terms of getting some accurate the essential D matrix. So the conventional D approach is basically using the eight point algorithm, uh, computing the fundamental matrix first and converting this into the essential D matrix. Uh, but you can also consider using the five point algorithm, uh, which is not computing the fundamental D matrix, but directly computing the essential D matrix from the normalized the 2D coordinates. Uh, so that's the another direction that we can do the same thing. Any other questions? Good. 
Okay, so let's then get back to the things. So what we wanted to do here is that basically we wanted to we were discussing the ideas in terms like how we can do some three D reconstruction from the multi view images, right? And here the whole the idea is that uh, for the three D point cloud reconstruction, uh, we don't need to use any kind of neural net. As you can see, we can estimate uh, the KRD matrix for each of the view using the pixel wise the correspondence. And then we can run the triangulation, basically shooting a ray uh, from the each of the view and you find the intersection, the points of the rays. So in this way, actually we can reconstruct the whole the 3D thing using uh, from the, the 2D images without having any using some kind of neural network, right? But what would be kind of the limitation of such kind of the method? Any thoughts on that? I mean, there can be lots of the issues with this, but in terms of like reconstructing the 3D, uh, what do the kind of the limitations of, of like this approach? Yeah, there can be lots of kind of issues. I mean, there can be some also the challenges in terms of finding the corresponding the pixels. And these are also all the cases in, uh, that we are uh, only basically finding the corresponding the key points, the 2D images and reconstructing 3D by shooting the rays from the key points and finding the intersection the points. So what we typically get is this kind of the output. Uh, so we can typically, I mean, this is actually quite dense, the output. Uh, I guess this is more than the results of the structure from the motion. Uh, but typically the output of the structure from motion uh, is basically a set of the key points. Basically we are kind of getting some kind of the, the point cloud as the output, uh, which means that we can get some kind of the rough structure of the geometry. Uh, but this will not be the case that we can really have some kind of the old, the full the 3D geometry that can be actually rendered into some kind of the real, the photo real, I mean, photo like some kind of images. So actually if for many kind of the application, uh, we might want to see the results like this. Uh, so, let me see this. so from the given set of the images that we have on the left side, uh, we want to see really like just like rendering this 3D into any arbitrary views while basically achieving some kind of the photorealistic images. Uh, I'm not sure whether the animation looks smooth on your side, uh, but actually what we I'm showing is that uh, you know, the right hand side should be basically some kind of the animation that you know, we are basically moving the camera very smoothly in the space with, with some kind of very smooth changes of the images. I'm not sure, I guess the animation might be has some lags, I guess. Yeah, but basically here the whole the point is that uh, we want to basically get the 3D construction in a way that when we see the 3D scene from the any arbitrary 3D viewpoint, we can render the 3D things into the 2D image in a way that we can get some kind of the photorealistic the images as the output. So we cannot get this kind of output using the uh the reconstruct the three the the point cloud uh, reconstruct by the from the motion. So here basically the goal is basically is that how we can uh get this kind of the photorealistic images from the arbitrary view uh from the output of the three D reconstruction. So that's the whole the goal of the the neural rendering. Uh, so let me move on to the neural rendering. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, so basically the goal here is that not just like reconstructing the 3D things from the multi view images, but we want to results of like basically rendering the 3D output into the RB2D view and basically getting this kind of the photorealistic image like this. 
very low stick images. So here the basically the setup is that we are having, uh, so we are not only basically uh, doing the 3D reconstruction, but we also do some kind of the novel view synthesis. From any kind of the view, uh, we want to basically synthesize the image, image like we are seeing that the object or the scene from that view. So the, here the focus is not to just like reconstruct the 3D sheet, but actually basically to synthesize the image from that view. And this is the same setup with the search from motion in a way that we only have the multi-view images, but we are not having any kind of the information about like how the 3D shape looks like. So that's basically the setup that we have. So based on this kind of the, the, uh, the framework that what we can do, well, obviously we can apply this kind of technique for many kind of the, some AR, VR the applications. And this would be one of the examples that how, I'm not sure how it would it look like on your side. Yeah, so to basically to make this kind of the, some interaction between the uh, some virtual the objects and the real the objects, uh, we also need to not only get in some kind of some geometric information, but we also uh, we should be able to basically render all the things from the any arbitrary views. So basically, that's kind of the one of the applications that we can see as the kind of neural rendering the techniques, and also we can obviously. Uh, uh, scan every the 3D object or 3D scenes, and then basically reconstruct the whole the things into the 3D the shapes like this in a way that we can render them uh, from the any arbitrary views while basically achieving some very realistic images like this. So here the whole the setup is that we are having some kind of uh, in, we are making basically a neural network for this. So what sort of neural net we are gonna make is that uh, we are going to basically uh, have the neural net, which takes the camera D matrix as the input. Uh, and for each of the view, uh, we are basically making the 2D, the, the, the real the image from that view. And what we have is that we are basically having this kind of the pair of this kind of the, the camera D matrix and the image from that view. Uh, in our the training time, uh, we are basically having the pairs of the input and the output. And the input is basically the camera D matrix, and the output is basically the image from that view. And we are training the neural net with the loss function, uh, which is basically minimizing the difference with the rendered the image and the, the ground truth the image that we have from that view. Make sense? So this will be basically the setup that we are training the a neural net from one scene. Uh, for each of the one scene, uh, we are having the bunch of the pairs of the input and the output, and the input is the camera D matrix, and the output would be basically uh, the image from that view. Uh, and then we are basically minimizing the difference between the, the image that we are generating using the neural net uh, with the ground truth the image from that view, right? And what we want to do in the test time is that uh, when you basically pick some kind of the any uh, random input, which is even not included in our the training data, so from any kind of the unseen the viewpoint, uh, we also generate the 2D image from that view. So that's basically what we are going to do. Make sense? So we are basically making a such of the neural net, which is taking the pairs uh, of the input, the camera D matrix, and also obviously with the intrinsic D matrix as well, uh, ex extrinsic intrinsic D matrix uh, from the camera D matrix uh, with the view image uh, from that view, uh, from a bunch of the, pair, uh, the pairs of this, uh, we are training the neural net. Uh, in a way that like when you basically render uh, the, the 3D scene from that specific view, uh, we can render the image uh, that looks like the same uh, with the image that uh, we have for each of the view. So the, here the question is the how we are going to basically generate such kind of image, right? So we can actually consider making any kind of the arbitrary, some kind of random neural net. Uh, we can really make some kind of some MLP, whatever kind of digital neural network. So random the black box, which really takes some kind of the camera matrix as the input, and then output the image from that view, right? So this is solo. Uh, but you will see that actually this kind of neural net does not work at all. Uh, so we can make some any kind of arbitrary some random the black box that takes the camera matrix as the input and then basically generate the image as the output. 
Uh, but actually this kind of neural net does not work that well. So what we are going to do is that actually we are going to reconstruct the 3D shape using the neural net and render the 3D shape into each of the 2D plane. So what we are going to do is that we are actually leveraging some kind of the physical property uh, in terms of not making some kind of the black box the neural net, but basically doing some kind of the 3D reconstruction first, some kind of the 3D reconstruction, and render this into the 2D plane uh, in a way that we can uh, leverage some kind of the, the typical the rendering the process uh, that basically map, that is basically mapping the 3D to the 2D. Next sense. Uh, okay. Uh, any question on this? I think I've seen some question. So if you have any question, please send a message to me. Yeah, so that's basically what we are going to do. Uh, and for that, basically we can, so what would be basically the idea that we can render the 3D shape into the 2D images? So if you took the computer graphics course, there will be, you will know that there are some two conventional ways for that. Uh, do you have any ideas? Like what would be some of the, the typical the rendering techniques? Anyone who took the computer graphics course before? So this is basically a subject that is basically discussed in the computer graphics course. So we are not getting into all the details here, but if you are interested more in some details, then I recommend you to take the computer graphics course. Uh, but basically these are all the ideas about some kind of projection from the 3D to the 2D. But it's matter of like, you know, how we make the algorithm in terms of like making it like object centric or basically image centric. Uh, the idea of the object centric the, uh, the rendering is called the rasterization. So here basically what we do is that for each of the, the face in the mesh, so let's assume that the 3D shape is represented as a mesh, right? Then in this case, uh, we're gonna have like the a soup of the faces, like the bunch of the faces. And then we what we do is that we project each of the 3D face into the onto the 2D plane, right? So we're gonna have like these kind of like the 3D points projected uh, over the image plane. Then for any kind of the quantity, uh, some kind of properties that we define for each of the purposes, like the colors, whatever kind of things, uh, we can interpolate all this kind of information defined for each of these purposes uh, into the pixels uh, within the projected area of the triangle, right? But there can be another the triangle that also basically have some kind of overlap in the projection the area in the 2D space, which means that uh, one pixel here can be included in the project area of like the one triangle here and the other triangle here as well. Then what we need to do is that we need to basically also check the depths uh, for each of the points. We also need to calculate the distance uh, basically uh, from the 2D plane to the 3D the, the plane, uh, which also can be calculated with basically interpolation of the depths for each of the vertices. And by comparing the depths uh, of the, the the, the point of like this green triangle and the red triangle, uh, we can choose like which the uh, some kind of quantity uh, that we are going to take uh, from this kind of the two uh, the, the the triangles. So that's the basic idea of like the object centric uh, the rendering, which is called the rasterization, uh, which is basically the idea that we are basically projecting all the three D triangle uh, into the two D plane and doing some kind of the interpolation for the pixels within the uh, project the area and checking like which information we take uh, based on the, the depth information uh, for each of the triangles. So that's the rasterization. And the other way around is basically the image centric way. So now we are not just considering like projecting the 3D the triangles into the 2D plane, but actually we should array uh, from each of the pixel and find the first intersection of the point uh, with the objects. So there can be some multiple intersection points, uh, but we are basically assuming that everything is basically the solely the object. Uh, then we just need to find the first intersection point uh, from the ray to the 3D object. 
and we basically retrieve some kind of information like the color information or some kind of appearance information. So that's the other way around, which is called the ray casting, uh, which is kind of emicentric the, the algorithm. So you can say that it's a matter of like we are seeing some kind of the 3D, 2D, 3D, 2D, 2D projection or 2D to 3D with the ratio thing, right? So this is the only difference. So basically what we can do is that we can see this kind of some, uh, so we can leverage this kind of the 3D, 2D, 2D mapping uh, in terms of like doing some kind of the 3D reconstruction. And there was already a, a really this kind of idea uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, reconstructing the 3D shapes, which only the multi-view images. So what they have done is that this was the, the exactly same setup. We want to reconstruct the 3D uh, from the only, from the multi-view images, from a set of the images, from the multiple D views, uh, we want to reconstruct uh, the 3D shape in a way that when you render this, the output 3D shape into each of the view, that looks exactly the same with the image that we have. So that was the basic idea for this kind of the, the previous work. And for that, what they have done is that they started from a kind of the, some sort of the template mesh. So here the case, the, the template mesh is the, this ellipsoid mesh. Uh, and then we are iteratively deforming uh, this mesh in a way that the output becomes the, the objects that we want to see. So when you render this 3D mesh into the, each of the view that we have, uh, we can basically match the given the image for each of the view. So this is basically doable the idea. We can really try this. Uh, what would be kind of a limitation like this kind of the idea? Question. Uh, here the question is that uh, what would be limitation like this idea? Uh, so let, let's see this specific idea. So this was the case that we start from some very uh, complete, like, you know, the mesh, uh, the temple mesh, which is the ellipsoid mesh. And we are, you know, progressively basically deforming this mesh uh, in a way that, you know, when we render this mesh into each of the view, uh, the render the image, basically it can match the image that we have, right? For those kind of the cases, what would be kind of the limitations? Yeah, basically, yeah, by the way, yeah, someone pointed out that this was the case like working with a single image, right? Yeah. This paper introduced this idea for the single image. And there's another the paper which is called the pixel to mesh plus plus, uh, which extend the same idea for the multiple images. Uh, and also the same idea has been used uh, multiple times to uh, reconstruct 3D things from the multiple images. So obviously one of the kind of limitation like such kind of work is that uh, this is the case that we are generating the final D mesh uh, using from the, the template mesh. So obviously we cannot change the, uh, the topological the structure of the given the template mesh, uh, which means that if we want to make some kind of the, for example, like donut like the shapes, having some kind of the holes here, uh, then we cannot basically make a donut by deforming the ellipsoid mesh. So we are having some kind of the topological the, the limitation in terms of like uh, some making some variations of the topology. Right? I think someone posted the question to me, but I said, I cannot see. Oh, so if you are uh, sending a message to me, uh, actually I'm also using the iPad, so there might be to a console me myself. So please choose send message to the other. We're sending some, I think someone is sending a message to me. Uh, so yeah, here the question is that, what if we had a different topology more hope than they say we can have it? What if we had a different to put more hope that the LC can represent? Yeah, obviously, uh, we cannot only represent, we, we can only represent the 3D shapes 
that has the same topology with the elliptoid mesh here. So everything should be basically this pure topology shape without having any hole. So that's kind of the, like one limitation like this approach. Uh, query the, the other question is that would we need to query the neural network every time we want to render a new scene? Uh, we should probably not be able to have a real-time view using. Uh, well, yeah, so that's what the thing. So uh, if we use the neural net for the things, uh, it depends on like how we define the rendering the process. So if we can use some the, the classical the rendering the pipeline, uh, that would be really the case that we are doing some kind of a 3D construction. Uh, but if we also involve the neural net in the rendering the process, then every time when you render the 3D object into the 2D images, uh, we also need to run the full process of the neural net that will result in also the loss of the computation time. So that's actually one of the issues that we also need to discuss uh, for the later the parts of the neural rendering. Uh, so this is basically uh, the kind of limitation here. So basically, uh, you know, when you have this kind of the pipeline, uh, there is basically some kind of the scope of the shapes that we can generate because all the output shapes uh, should have the same the topological the structure with the template image. Uh, but if we actually, we also have, as we have discussed in the previous lectures, uh, if we want to make some kind of the uh, a mesh with the arbitrary topology, we know that that's very challenging problem, right? Also, one of the issues in terms like we construct the 3D shapes in this way is that uh, this, this kind of the updates of this kind of like the 3D shape will be very slow because what we are going to do is that every time we are shooting the ray from the 2D to 3D, and then we're going to have like one intersection of the point, right? Uh, even for the rasterization, it's basically the same. We need some kind of the, the face that is visible from the 2D plane to the 2D plane will be updated uh, by the loss function aligning the 3D to the 2D, right? The rest of the part is not updated, which means that when you shoot a ray from the, each of the 2D pixel into the 3D space, only one point that has the intersection point with the 2D pixel uh, will be updated. So this kind of the process of like learning the, the mesh using the ray casting or the rasterization will be very slow uh, in terms of seeing the convergence. So those are kind of limitations. And also what we discussed in the previous lecture is that we actually have seen that the impulse representation has lots of kind of the advantages in the 3D construction in terms of that it does not have any kind of the topological constraint and also some kind of the limitations in terms of like the resolution as well. Uh, so we know that impulse representation seems kind of the best, right? Uh, for the, some 3D reconstruction the tasks. But then the problem is that how we can render the implicit representation into the two images? How we can apply some kind of the rasterization uh, or the ray casting? So let's think about the case that into like the doing some ray casting. So if we shoot a ray from the 2D plane, into the 3D space, when you represent the 3D object as kind of the, uh, some impulse representation, like the sine distance function, how can you find the intersecting point? So that's kind of the challenging the problem, right? Uh, so it becomes much easier if we have the mesh-like structure, when you have some very explicit representation of the surface, uh, it becomes much easier to find the intersection. Uh, but if we have the implicit function, like the sine distance function, uh, it becomes slightly more the tricky in terms of finding the intersection point between the from the ray to the uh, the 3D shape. So that's basically what we need to do. So let's continue discussing all the things uh, from on Wednesday, and we're gonna also move on to the the idea of the nerve. Any questions on this? So we're gonna uh, discuss the nerve and also finish the discussion of the nerve on Wednesday. So I will see you on Wednesday. Bye.